What we're going to focus on tonight is called the Great Bend of the Gila. And most of us know the little phrase that's 110 in Gila Bend and so on. It's not a place that um, most of us think of spending a lot of time, but it is a place that over the course of history has seen a lot of people passing through, going east and west. It's a place that has a volcanic landscape that has been the, uh, a literally a canvas on which rock art has been uh, put into these dark black rocks over millennia. And it's a, it's a really very special place if you get off of that freeway, off of that Interstate 8, and wander around in the Gila River floodplain and visit these uh, rock art sites visit some of the Hoakam ball courts, see how the Patayan folks of the, of the lower uh, Gila, lower Colorado area uh, came together and um, uh, integrated with the, the Hoakam folks of the, the middle Gila and, and so on. It's a place, it's a really dynamic place. The archeological record out there on the ground is extremely rich. Archeology span Southwest is a, a local partner with the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the Great Bend of the Gila National Monument was introduced in the spring of this year by our uh, representative Raul Grijalva as a proposed national monument. So we have a bill before con Congress. Uh, the National Trust has uh, designated this as one of their national treasures, places of national significance that uh, their preservation would make a difference in telling the national story. So. This is a place of uh, what we think is really substantial importance. And instead of focusing on just individual sites one at a time, it's really a whole cultural landscape that's, that's the focus out there. So tonight's speaker, uh, Dave Doyle, has invested a great deal of time out in, in that part of, of the world. And Dave and I go back to graduate sc uh, school times, uh, early 70s. We've actually followed each other across the landscape. Dave worked at Escalante Ruin in 1972? Three. Three. Uh, in 74, I was out in the immediately adjacent area, uh, sort of following him across that landscape. Dave has worked up at the Salmon Ruins. Archaeology Southwest has a program up at Salmon Ruins. I did my dissertation out in the Western Papagoria. Dave works at uh, the... <clears throat> is at Luke Air Force Base and is responsible for a lot of that area out there. So we bump into each other a lot and I'm really honored to have him sharing with you tonight the uh, story of his work and interest in the Gila Bend area. So Dave, thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good evening. I debated on whether or not to, to start with this story, but my day started a little differently because I work for the Air Force today. Got a <clears throat> message saying you need to get out here. I, I hadn't intended to go to the office before driving to Tucson, but had to go out along with at least 800,000 other people today who had to show up at work just to sign a piece of paper giving the government the right to lay us off, uh, leave without pay indefinitely, as if they had to ask us. But Bill knows in the line of work he's in because he deals with it every day, it's hard to get away from politics these days. Anyway, welcome tonight. It's very good, uh, very uh, nice to see you all here. Uh, <clears throat> this should be, it'll be interesting for me too because I'd never given this talk before. Uh, we're all used to talking, standing up PowerPoint, props, so I had to have some props, so Kate kindly ran off some uh, maps I sent her that I'll refer to. Uh, I just found it hard, since I'm actually going to be talking about particular sites, uh, not to have a map for you to look at. Uh, you don't need to study them necessarily, but you can if you want. This is going to be strictly stream of consciousness, you know, it might not be linear. It's, it's whatever I happen to scribble down on my, my uh, note. 
uh, or my sheets of paper as I go through them. I did, uh, did want to start with a wonderful picture of, a, of some rock art that Bill was actually alluding to. Uh, now, uh, he didn't mention it, but I did see that little map floating around. Okay, everybody has that? That's a wonderful little map. So, but I didn't want to start off this evening with one because I don't know how much I'm going to be talking about rock art. It's, I love rock art, but it's not my specialty. Um, I work with a lot of wonderful people who know a lot more about it than I do, but, but I wanted to start with this to give you a sample. And this is at a place called Sears Point, which is, uh, would be on the western side of that map. And uh, I was talking to Don Weaver, who was the principal investigator on a project that, at the Pecos Conference this summer, and they had just finished a project out here at Sears Point using some ultra new technology. Maybe some of you know about it. But uh, what I remember is Don told me that they had recorded in this area over 2,000 separate panels. So it gives you some idea. This was, this was kind of a, this was an important stopping place along the river. The Gila River was a main avenue corridor of, of travel for, I don't know, pick a number, 20,000 years, 10,000 years. Uh, I mean, people ran up and down this river. And uh, ultimately, it's where Kino came through here, uh, De Garza came through here, uh, Eonza, that's right. Um, 49ers came through here, Stagecoach came through here. Uh, I'm sure, did I hear some other names? Settlemeyer, well, yes. And uh, probably all are, probably the early Spanish, earlier Spanish, the earliest Spanish. So uh, <clears throat> it, was a, it was a main travel corridor, and I think a lot of, some of this may be related, I don't know. Uh, a lot of, well, what this panel to me looks more like a whole calm than Pattayan. I understand most of what's there is Pattayan. And it looks highly, uh, highly ritual, ceremonial in, in nature, some of it. Uh, there's actually a blending of probably two, three different traditions in there. The Pattayan from the west, the Gila style from the east. There's actually a style now they're calling uh, Sears Point style. So there's a fair amount of research on the rock art, and it's a very important part of the monument. The history of Gila Bend is we don't know a whole lot about it. There hasn't been that much work done, and the work that has been done hasn't been well reported. Uh, <clears throat> but what I did give you was a list of references, some very new, some standard, uh, that are generally available if you want to do any follow-up. How many people know have heard of Norton Allen? Okay, so there's a fair number of you that don't know the legacy of Norton Allen. I should mention that then. Norton was, uh, and his father, Norton had a health problem. And uh, I don't know if, if that specifically is the reason, but they were from Southern California and they started wintering in Gila Bend. And the father was very interested in the antiquities of the area. And <clears throat> what happened is they realized in the 50s and the 60s that all those wonderful villages along the Gila River on either side of the Great Bend were being plowed for agriculture. And if you go down there now, that's, I was gonna say that's what you see as farmland. Actually, if you go down there now, all you see is solar sites. But um, all those, the big villages except for Gatlin, well, most of them, I'll say, were plowed under. And uh, they would go to the university and talk to Emil Howery and others to get people interested in the archeology of the Bend and nobody was, nobody was that interested or they were too busy. So Norton and his father excavated for five decades, something, along the Gila River as well as other places and uh, amassed uh, marvelous, marvelous collections of material. And to make the story short, uh, donated much of it to the Arizona State Museum. So over a couple of decades, and Al Ferg had a lot to do with that. And Al would go to California and work with Ethel Norton when he was alive. So uh, they're very big names in the Gila Bend area. Well, I don't remember why I put this in here, other than I said, Kate, I can't do anything without some props, you know? And so uh, 
I put a map in here, and I guess it's to show you sort of where the Great Bend fits in to the, the rest of the archaeology of the Hocom region. This is actually a map by uh, Randy McGuire, who some of you probably were here to hear him speak at some point, uh, maybe last year or sometime. So Randy actually did a paper called Peripheries in the Hocom area or something. He broke down the, the Hocom region. Uh, and uh, gosh, I can't count how many. But you see that it situates Gila Bend, anyway, over about in the middle in the far west. Uh, certainly from this map, it, it sort of looks peripheral, doesn't it? You know, on, And uh, on the, the edge of the Holcom region along the Gila. Now, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, I, uh, I did a paper in that book, uh, Fragile Patterns, that I called Edge Work. The late prehistory of the Gila Bend frontier. Well, you know, the article was just going to be called the late prehistory of the Gila Bend frontier because I sort of saw it as a, as a frontier area. And this map clearly shows it is relative to the Holcom region. But then, you know, uh, <clears throat> about that time, one of my favorite writers in uh, graduate school, a guy named Hunter S. Thompson, uh, expired. And I don't know if any of you remember Thompson talking about edge work. Edge work was his favorite thing. It got him, it got him the most excited when he was, he was doing his, what he called his edge work. So I thought, OK, <clears throat> a little inside joke. So I actually titled this article after <clears throat> Hunter S. Thompson. But a uh, little connection that you might not otherwise make with Gila Bend. <laughs> so. So I, he might have, he may or may not have enjoyed it, but uh, the thing, like like Bill said, you know, you don't, you know, Gila Bend is not a, like a destination. You know, <laughs> we tried for 20 years to make Gila Bend a destination. Everybody said, what? <laughs> you know, you know, especially if you're Gila Bend, poor Gila Bend, under 2,000 people, hotter than hell, and you're in the same county as Phoenix, what they call the great state of Maricopa. Uh, you know, you just don't get heard if you're Gila Bend and you're fighting uh, Phoenix uh, in Maricopa County. So it's just really tough, and it's not just Gila Bend. It's all these little, all these little towns around uh, the state trying to do something with their resources. It's just very hard to get heard. So, so there are some challenges there, uh, and right now they seem to be explicitly focused on the solar energy. They, they're saying that they're the solar capital of the world, and that's where uh, the focus of Gila Bend is now. So uh, I'll just, for the time being, probably maybe come back to it, but I want to introduce that concept of sort of frontier on the edge, uh, sort of see, and that map shows it fairly well, kind of on the, the, the western frontier of the whole calm. Now, what these maps show, they're kind of like ideas or prompters for me to remember to talk about something important, you know. <laughs> so string some ideas together. So the next one, this is very important in terms of trying to understand Hocom regional organization, I think. Now, we all know about Hocom archaeology, right? Does anybody not know about Hocom archaeology? OK. Uh, I'm glad I asked that question. I'm glad you raised your hands. The Hocom uh, is, the, is a name. It's actually a derivative of an Odom Indian name, local Indian name, uh, that is translated variously uh, as ancestors. But it's the name given to the prehistoric culture, uh, that the, the dominant culture that occupied South Central Arizona from the time of Christ to, to 1500. Does that help? A little bit. Uh, they're 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 most characterized by uh, uh, their the extensive irrigation systems along the rivers, uh, large villages uh, consisting of pit houses, uh, cremation, uh, burial, and, and they made very distinctive pottery, including a wonderful red on buff, uh, very lively designed pottery, and they also uh, created public architecture 
including things we call ball courts, big earthen features that they played games in at one period. And later, they uh, started building with uh, Adobe, um, similar to uh, Adobe technology probably in Mexico. And that, and that would have started somewhere about 1100 up to the time that they disappeared. They're responsible for the Casa Grande near Coolidge. How many have been to Casa Grande? Oh, good, good. There's this thing called Trace Grande, so we always, you know, Mesa, Pueblo, and Casa. And uh, <clears throat> I remember that from a previous speaker who said, how many people have been to Chaco Canyon? Everybody, ooh, everybody, everybody in the room had been to Chaco Canyon, you know? Well, the difference between that Anasazi and Chaco is that those people built out of stone and they, they over-engineered those buildings and so they're still standing a thousand years after they were built. And down here, uh, <clears throat> there wasn't a need for that and actually there wasn't that much stone. So Ho'okam up until about 1100 consistently built these single unit earth lodges called pit houses. And so they, their sites are very hard to see. You know, they're not really impressive. And when people first came in the area, they did see uh, that their villages are extremely large, sometimes multiple square miles, and consisted of huge earthen mounds, many of which were trash mounds, many of which were melted architecture. So they didn't quite, quite get the press that uh, the prehistoric uh, villages did in Chaco. But, but nonetheless, I think that uh, <clears throat> the Holcom area probably contained the biggest villages, probably the most people uh, <clears throat> of anywhere in the Southwest. Anything else we need to know about Holcom before I kind of... Um, Holcom is the name that's generally given to the uh, culture in the Gila Bend area. And probably uh, the line is probably drawn at the Painted Rocks Reservoir just west of Gila Bend, what, 10 miles, I don't know, 20 miles, some 10, 20 miles west. Now, <clears throat> any other questions? Okay, uh, it's important, I, I, I kind of gloss things there, so if you have any questions, just you know, let, me, let me know. Uh, but the next uh, map is very interesting because it tells us something about Hocom settlement pattern and what we call regional organization. How their, how their villages were kind of related to each other across space. So one very interesting point I'm going to make about this is that there's something from this I can surmise there's something very special going on in Gila Bend between about 800 and 1200. Now, <clears throat> at this time period, the main public, public architecture the whole com used in their villages as an integrative feature uh, is what we call the ball court. And every major, beach, every major village had a ball court and a plaza where people got together and uh, <clears throat> traded, uh, visited, and played this ritual ball game. And that was the main, as I said, the main organizing feature up until 1100. So what this map shows you is that uh, the squares have one ball court and the triangles have two ball courts. <clears throat> well, what's really interesting, and so all of these are Horocom villages, and you can see Phoenix is over on the right, coming on down to the confluence of the South and the Gila, which would be out near, let's see, well, I'll just say way west Phoenix, and then you get to the uh, Agua Fria. Everybody know about where I am, Agua Fria and Salt River? Uh, and then from that stretch, down around the curve, down to Gillespie Dam, uh, all you have are single court villages, a series of single court villages. And you can see they're very evenly spaced. This is one thing that's kind of typical of uh, Ho'okam in this time period. Throughout, throughout the basin range, they're, they're very evenly spaced about, uh, evenly rather. But then when you get to the Great Bend, one thing that's interesting, all of a sudden, well, first of all, I want to say you go about 25 miles and you have these, these single court villages. Then you get to the, uh, the Bend and there's a huge cluster of two or more court villages. 
And we generally think, you know, the, the more courts, the more important the site is in terms, you know, in very general terms, in terms of population, uh, ritual, um, and uh, so on. So I, I've called this a potential uh, mini core. We call the Phoenix Basin area where the salt in Phoenix and from where the salt meets the Gila and back up through into Snake Town on the Indian Reservation. We call that the core area, the Phoenix Basin. People familiar with that? That's, that's the core of Ho'okam. That's where there are the most villages, the biggest villages, the most stuff, the, the greatest fluorescence of Ho'okam culture. Uh, and then we see, for some reason that we still don't know why, we see down out here, way out west at, at the Great Bend, we've got another cluster of multiple, multiple court sites. So uh, I, I throw that out as a question. I think one thing that was happening here is that once you get past Gillespie Dam, how many people have been down out Old 80? You drive down Gillespie Dam, the back way into Gila Bend. Well, that far, that country, we, first of all, when you get to Gillespie Dam, it's where the, the, historically a big dam was built to feed the irrigation systems down valley. Well, the Hohokam probably did that too a thousand years ago. But what happens once you get past that dam, the valley opens up and it's just, I think, tremendous farmland in there. I think it was highly productive farmland between uh, the Gillespie Dam Point and around the Great Bend. I, I kind of suspect the productivity of the land might have had something to do with all these villages. How many people heard of Emil Howery? All right, good, 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 good. We have a commonality here. <laughs> Doc Howery was my, ch my PhD chairman at U of A in the 70s. I had the uh, good fortune of, of uh, spending a lot of time with him. Doc Harry, of course, was Mr. Ho'okam. Probably still is if you had to pick one name. Uh, although Doc Harry wouldn't recognize Ho'okam archaeology as it is today. They were struggling during Doc's uh, period, his, at the time he was doing research, to try to figure out how were these villages organized? What, what was the organizing element? Uh, you know, what were people relating to? You know, for in other words, we go out here, we have downtown Tucson, you know. It's an or organizing element on the landscape. You know, you know where downtown Tucson is, or downtown Phoenix, or whatever. What, what was the organizing element for Ho'okam society in their villages? And that was a very big question for generations. And it was, uh, and Harry still hadn't recognized this when he published uh, his last Ho'okam, his Snake Town book in 76. I know because I talked to him about it. Uh, there was another guy, uh, another Dave, there are a lot of Daves that came out of Tucson at that time. Uh, this one's named Dave Wilcox, actually took uh, Howie's Snake Town book and the earlier one and did some basic pattern recognition with no new field work and came up with this, this, uh, this aha moment where he recognized how village, how houses were clustered around uh, plazas, and and then there were these this kind of building block of these houses and plazas surrounding a central plaza, and which usually on either side of the central plaza was the ball court or the platform or some other kind of central feature. So it was like, aha, we now know how the Ho'okam organized their villages. And it's really funny, it took us that long because a lot of us see a lot of Mesoamerica in Ho'okam. And if you go, you just we could rattle off a whole bunch of traits that make Ho'okam sound awfully Mexican. Mesoamerican, I should say. Um, okay, now I completely lost my point. So, <laughs> so if you go to the south, this is stream of consciousness, right? If you go to the south, you will see for thousands of years, people organize their villages around plazas you know, or ball courts, or temples. So this is a very old, old uh, 
organizational device that we, we finally identified in, uh, <clears throat> in HOACOM. Uh, thanks in large part to Dave Wilcox's work in the 80s, I believe. And then we knew, what, once we knew what we were looking for, everybody goes, wow, how did we not see that before? So, and that gets me to the next one. I can, I can bring in Doc Harry again. <clears throat> so, the Gatlin site. I got about three million things I want to say about this. I'm trying to figure out which one I'll say first. First of all, I want to point out that it is a National Historic Landmark. Okay, do you know what it takes to become a National Historic Landmark? Bill does. It takes an act of Congress, literally, to become a National Historic Landmark. That means that this site, that this, this resource has significant value to contribute to the great American story. Not the Gila Bend story, not the Arizona story, the great American story. <clears throat> there are two National Historic Landmarks in the Hohokam. One of them is the Gatlin site. So a landmark means that the Congress really didn't have to do anything. They didn't necessarily have to spend any money, you know, but they designated it as something of great historical importance. And then whatever the local owner, I mean, some last national landmarks are in fact privately owned. This one happens to be open, owned by the town of Gila Bend. Pueblo Grande is owned by the city of Phoenix. I also had the honor of being director there for a bunch of years. Uh, so that's one important thing. And uh, <clears throat> when I was working as a consultant to the town of Gila Bend, uh, well, me and my team, we insisted with the town that they create a covenant within their town charter recognizing uh, the importance of this National Historic Landmark status, and the town would do nothing to alter that status. That the town would maintain this property as a park for public enjoyment. And so far they have. Okay, so what this also shows, well, first of all, this is a map I put together from Norton Allen's notes. Norton didn't do very many maps, but he took copious notes. The challenge being if you could figure it out, because it's in code. <laughs> Sherry Freeman finally figured out Norton's code. I'd, I'd been perplexed for years. And he'd write these little bitty notes, and he'd, he'd, he'd fold them up, and he'd stick them in little matchboxes, and, you know, and he'd just box after box of Norton stuff. And Sherry stuck with it and figured out his code. So she, should, she did get an award. I think she should get the, I don't know, word of the decade. And once Sherry figured that out, I could figure out all the names that are on this map. The big black dots are mortuary areas. They are cemeteries. So once I could do that, then I could figure out the code, go back to the artifacts, and figure out where the artifacts came on the site. <clears throat> and this is the only site that's been done for there. So Norton has a bunch of sites that I, I forgot to identify, <laughs> which are on this map I already showed you. Uh, but the Gatlin is the one I wanted to focus on because there's, we know more about it. So there you get the idea of a large Hohokam village in the Gila Bend area. Now this one, like Citrus, probably about 300 acres sprawling around uh, along the river. Uh, the 12 mile site, which is on your other map, uh, had four ball courts, if not five ball courts, and uh, was at least 300 acres, had at least three, 30, 30 large mounds. These sites, uh, I have argued, were probably on peer status with Snake Town uh, in between about 800 and 1100. These are very large villages. Now, what, what this also uh, shows you, you can see I've circled in the center. There's something called a platform. And then you see Great Plaza. This is the plaza I was talking about. This is the organizing uh, element of the Hohokam Village. And you see across from the platform uh, is Ball Court 1. 
So what you're seeing here is a plan that's played out in scores of Oakam villages across the desert. Everything relates back to the Great Plaza, Ball Court on one side, and Gatlin, just like Snake Town, platform on the side opposite the Ball Court. So then you see everything fans out around that organizing principle of the Great Plaza. And one of the really interesting things that came out of this one that I didn't see at Snake Town, you can kind of see between the platform Great Plaza, the, the mounds seem to sort of line up. They almost look like there's streets in there. Any questions? I'm doing real well here. Okay, question? The question was, what happened to the whole com? Okay, we'll kind of keep that in mind. And because uh, it happens here earlier than it happens elsewhere. Uh, and uh, I don't think I'm quite to that point, but uh, if I don't come back to it, please remind me. Okay, uh, another thing that happens, around 750, 800, we argue about this, maybe even earlier, they, they created these large features called ball courts that, as I said, is one of the central, central organizing elements of OCOM society. Then a little later, in, this, in what we call the Sacton phase, maybe sometime around 1,000 or so, I think maybe earlier, they started building these little earthen features called platforms. The earliest platform that we know about that we call an artificially constructed platform was a snake town, probably started around 1,000. And it was a very low, three feet tall, uh, I don't remember, maybe 30 feet across, 40 feet across, uh, just a flat little platform. No architecture on top, probably had some steps going up to it, looked like a dance platform, some kind of ceremonial ritual platform. And uh, that started the series, and it's a basal, uh, uh, element in a whole series of platforms that they constructed over about a 250 year period. And uh, this little flat three foot high platform at, at Snake Town is the earliest one as I say. There is one of those at Gatlin. But what happened at Gatlin is when at right, right let me back up at Snake Town, Right after they, they built that little three foot high platform, the site was abandoned. I'm guessing they walked away from that site about 1075. And uh, Gatlin was occupied till about 1200, I figure, 1150, 1200. So the Gatlin platform actually saw another phase of construction beyond what they did at Snaketown. Uh, I call it a Santan phase mound. It doesn't matter, it's very early classic. So, uh, and that platform was built in a very highly visible spot in the center of the village. So from that alone, we know that it was important. So as a matter of fact, if you got, it was built right on the edge. So if you're down along the river and you're walking along and you're looking up the village, what you're seeing is that platform standing, sitting right there on the edge of the terrace. Well, that is this. Next. So uh, in the 50s, the Army Corps of Engineers decided to, uh, to build a flood control dam, <clears throat> which is a very long, sordid story, but they did. They displaced the local Indians. That's another long story. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, in the Great Flood in 93, they didn't manage it right, and, and uh, lawsuits that are still just being settled 20 years later, and, Anyway, that's the Painted Rocks Dam, big, long history. Well, that was the emphasis. I started to walk over there but, um, for this. So in the 50s, people started recognizing the need to what the English called rescue archaeology, that things that are being damaged or destroyed in the wake of, of, of uh, construction, we need to rescue these things, or we need to, in, in America, became known as salvage. I think rescue sounds a little better, but um, anyway, for the first time, uh, the feds came, came up with some money to give to the State Museum to go down and dig something in the footprint of the Painted Rocks Reservoir before everything was destroyed. So they went down there and they surveyed, and they, did a, they, they putted around a few other places, 
and did most of the work here. And would you know it, I, was, I have to add this to the story, this is the only site that's never been impacted by the Painted Rocks Reservoir. <laughs> it's hilarious, but, but it was a unique feature. And we come back to the, old, the name Norton Allen, who is still hanging around down there. And uh, Bill Wasley, knowing enough to, if you go out to an area and you want to start a project, you ask people who are working there, what's interesting? You know, what, what, do you, what do you do? What's, what's fun out here? What, you know, where are your big sites? So Norton Allen took Bill Wasley to this site. Now Norton knew that this, this is the Gatlin platform. <clears throat> Norton knew that this was a unique feature because of the, the 30 or 40 mounds at that site, big mounds, you know, twice as tall as I am before they were plowed. This is the only mound on the whole site that had no artifacts on it. Wow, that's something to remember, you know, that the rest of them were what we call trash mounds. You know, I mean, they, they tear down a house and they throw the construction debris on the mound and their broken pottery and their, their fired cracked rock and, you know, whatever on the trash mound. But, and so that's how Norton knew that this was special. Uh, and according to Norton, it was the only one in the Gila Bend area. I'm not sure, but maybe there was one at the 12-mile site, but we, we won't know that anymore. But the fact is that this is one that Wazley went out and excavated most of. Uh, you, I get a little schizophrenic about this because <laughs> Norton called this site the Gila Bend site because if you look at it on the map, this site is right at the 90 degree of the bend. And uh, <clears throat> everything, Norton knew that this was the central site. And everything that he did related back to this site. So uh, there's a site he called 12 mile site. What do you think he called it the 12 mile site? It's 12 miles from Gila Bend. As the three mile site and the four mile site from this spot, this Axis Monday, as I would call it, from the platform at the Gila Bend site. Wazi comes along and there's an old rancher <clears throat> who's living on the property, he actually plowed the property, the National Landmark. His name happened to be Gatlin. And Wazi decided he had renamed this site after his buddy Slick Gatlin. I still call it Gila Bend, so every once in a while, you know, I kind of got to go, it's, but it's Gatlin National Historic Landmark. So one of the things that Wazi did do <clears throat> was he excavated three quarters of this platform. And uh, he left this corner, see there's one corner of it, he left unexcavated, covered it up with black plastic, so it's still there sometime in the future. It could be excavated or it can be preserved. Now the problem is, that nobody knew anything about what Holcomb platform mounts looked like. And what we have to remember is that the, uh, we don't have to remember if you don't know this, I have to remember, that, that he actually dug this one before, was, uh, before Howie dug Mound 16 at Snake Town. So there was really, nobody knew anything. Howie actually went out and visited when they were digging this so when Howard went back to Snake Town, he kind of got one of those aha moments because he remembered this weird thing down at the, the Gila Bend site. So this is called the platform. So uh, I spent about 20 years with a, with a team trying to put together a public park at Gatlin Historic uh, Landmark. <clears throat> 